I have a ba an increasing balance between the spoken word and music that I listen to. I didn't realise that the written and spoken word meant so much to me. But when I was a child, because I'm the age I am, I read a lot. I was in bed a lot. I read and read and read. And then my second husband, uh, who was an actor, loved language. And he and I met. Well, we wooed each other, if you like, over T.S. Eliot, when the fire and the rose are one. So Eliot comes into my work. I think about what he says. At the same time, if I'm working on one of the ornate death pieces, then I will see what's on Radio 3. And if it's a composer I'm getting to know, like Shostakovich, I'm a bit late, I know, or even parts of Benjamin Britten, but mostly the darker Spanish Catholic music, I will have that on because it gives me, that's it, it gives me that kind of dread and an excitement which I have to have carried through what I'm doing because that's what makes me start working on a particular piece. It's very important, that's it. <laughs> Dallin Bennett, in his first play written in 1968, it's the most moving piece and I keep reading it and reading it. And it's almost the last speech of the play. And here I've just quoted, the hedges come down from the silent fields. The lease is out on the corner site. A butterfly is an event. In the play, 40 years on, the headmaster ends the play by saying that Britain is for sale. He doesn't say Britain is for sale. Um, a country detached from the mainland, I'm not quoting accurately, for sale, where we are being fed, a nation being fed on pap. The seashore has become marina, the countryside is a park. The corner site, the lease is up, and a, a butterfly is an event. Now he wrote that in 68, and the whole of that speech is absolutely wonderful, and it moves me every time I read it. And my husband was in 40 years on. He understudied John Gielgud in it. And so that was another thing that Brian moved me with. Alan Bennett's 40 years on. A lot of people ask me about why death and I am actually surprised when I had my big retrospective that so much is to do with death. But A, death is part of life. Um, and I suppose since the 40s when I first started working like this I mean, not the 40s, when I was 40, in, in the 70s, I had what's laughingly called a bit of a breakdown. And when I returned to working, I had seen, as I have actually through my life, a lot of death, a lot of loneliness, a lot of misuse of power. And on the other hand, I, apart from the bareness and horror of dreadful death, I was attracted to the Victorian rituals of it, the Georgian rituals. So this might answer actually why some of my work is very ornate and some of it is quite cruel, some people say. I mean Poppy Day, which I did in 07. Yes, some people think it's horrible. Yes, it is. But it was at a time, like various, a couple of other pieces, when the wounded weren't talked about. And I have never forgotten a very famous image in the first Gulf War, as it's laughingly set, told, called, of the, of the burnt soldier's face looking out of the tank. And they were on the retreat. Now, they weren't our side, our side, it was just so appalling. And Poppy Day, that's what it means increasingly, is 
is not the sentiment of a beautifully read poem. It's the harshness of the human body made up of bones. That's the reality of war. And only lately, and I have to say this, up until about, you know, some of the papers actually started writing about the wounded, I know for a fact that one service in a big London church about four years ago, the wounded were not allowed to be seen in case they upset the flavour of the procession. And they were shoveled out of the back door. That happened after the Falklands. We mustn't let them be seen. And I think it is so hypocritical and iniquitous. And that's why quite a number of my work is about that. This was one of the first pieces I did that almost did itself, which is important to me. I, I amass things and put them together and reject them. And I veiled this one like I veiled some pieces because of the, the widow wearing a veil. It, I could lift the veil for you. Yeah, it's, it's a piece called Pro Patri Mori. You know, and the other title is From Alice Hunter to William. Now, Alice Hunter was my grandma who sewed sailors' collars for a living. My grandfather died who I've lived after the First World War. So I thought, yes, this is it. <laughs> I've really, I really got involved in it. That was a long time ago. That was in the beginning of the 80s. And the pieces below it, of course, are to do with the army and the sentimentality and the non-sentimentality. But the little cross, that's the first time I'd used a poppy and a cross. And we lived in a part of London called Tooting. We had the Tooting Tower Company on one end of the road and the co-op funeral parlour the other. And it was a really grotty part of London. And I was walking home one day after teaching at Goldsmiths and I saw this abandoned cross with a poppy on in the gutter. And I thought, oh, how sad. I had to pick it up, so I did. And then, because I collect a lot of things, I thought, it needs a little jet wreath round it, which I made. And then I found a dead bird. And my husband said, what on earth are you putting that home for? And I said, because it's a person. And I use birds very often to represent people in the way that I use gloves. The fragility, and yet the strange strength there is you know, in the human body. The cushion on top of a piece called Lament, which is really the holster, which I bought in an, an army shop. It had been used and a revolver had been in it. And I kept it as I'm apt to do in my workroom, moved it around. And I have some old, very old poppies, Remembrance Day poppies, fabric ones. And I put them into the holster with three little memorial cards and a hook, a meat hook. I mean, it's quite understated. And the piece next to it, the little cushion on top, I've done three pieces like that, uh, two of which the Imperial War Museum showed in their last show. I've just had return. And they were based on, as I say, the Victorian regimental pin cushions. <laughs> I bought two about a shilling each ages ago and Brian and I used to say they look like Victorian bicycle saddles because they were heart shaped but very pointy and very hard decorated with beads and sequins they were sent home from the Boer War um, or soldiers bought them and sent them to their mothers so this piece on top here is a combination of the sentimentality and again if you look closely at it the repetition and futility of war, the bullets round it are used, deliberately used. Then there's this little sort of angel dolly, and I bound 
his or her eyes and she carries the little motive, Mission Impossible. But underneath, as you can see, there's a regimental button that I bored through and put a blood stain on so that it's as if the bullet has emerged from that button. And there are all sorts of little things listed. If you lift up the cross, there's a little bloodstained bandage with a tiny little Catholic symbol of the Holy Spirit, the dove, descending. And also written on it are the names of various feuds, battles from Vietnam, Korea onwards. It's that sort of relationship between the two. This, as you can see, is one of the more ornate pieces, but it is a memorial glove. I will not say the name of the person, but his initial is there. And it's called Aimez-vous le Big Mac? Do you like the Big Mac? Now, I never met the young man, but I was told about him. He was a friend of a friend. And I was given a piece of chiffon with pure gold, uh, you know, cut pieces like velvet. And I had it for a long time and looked at it and looked at it. And I started to ask the friend of a friend, would they mind telling me a little about him? Because I'd like to make a piece about him. So I asked him, asked him lots of questions and I thought it had to be a glove because of the affection I have for gloves as representative of the human being. I found out that he lived in Paris. He worked for a couturier and he'd been working on a dress of which the chiffon fabric had been made. So that was obvious to make it into a cuff. And I got more and more excited and this is the way I work, offering up bits of fabric putting a bit of gold braid, was that right? No, it wasn't, not sure. So I thought, okay, Big Mac. So I started with a piece of pink organza over pink silk and embroidered the M for MacDonald. Now it's hidden under the uh, back of his hand, but that was important to me to get that as a start. And then I found out he also worked at the Bastille Opera which gave me the idea of both of the little skull on a stick like a jester's because of his death and working for well, the opera, which is life and death, music is. Then uh, I have to say that he took his own life, which is why he's holding the court card, the hanged man from the tarot card. I gave him a gilded thimble because he would have liked a gilded thimble. And I'll go back to this taking of the life. You will see that there are a lot of needles of different sizes because apparently he scattered them around the place into his wrist. And there's a little red jewel, mock jewel, depicting a drop of blood which is just emerging from the cuff. Inside, the cuff is lined with blue. Now. A friend once said to me, well, I don't know why you bother to do that. Nobody sees it. But the point is, I do. And the person for whom I'm making the piece, whether it's just a destroyed hand or whether it's something ornate for a particular person, I have to do it. Because it's not made just as an exhibition piece. So round the edge of the cuff, inside, adding up to his years in age, are little stones which are his birthstone. And they're interrupted by a little seed pearl. The blue lining is because he loved going down to the south of France. He loved Africa. He loved the sun. He loved the blue skies. 
And I started with everything but the kitchen sink. Literally, what practically. And I do this, I surround myself in my workroom. And then I start subtracting, subtracting, subtracting. And then I needed to do an initial, which I've done in black, and it needed something, just something. And I think it took me about two hours to find, I know where that little something is. And it's got to be that, it's just got to be right for that young man. I became a Catholic at a rather rough time of my life after my first husband had died and our daughter. Um, maybe that's got something to do with my work. I'm sure it has. But I gave up being a Catholic. I had too many disbeliefs and disagreements. But I do read uh, the Revelations to St. John the Divine which is really about the apocalypse. And in that, it's described the four horsemen who come down to earth and they break a variety of seals. Bergman made a wonderful film called The Seventh Seal. Well, the pale rider, and behold, a pale rider, and his name was Death. And I thought, oh, yes. Now, he broke the fourth seal, which brought death, famine, destruction, which I've written on the little bones here. And I thought initially, well, death, black rider, and I thought, no, pale rider, the horse would be right. Well, I couldn't show the horse. So I wanted the glove to be pale and pure, as if the rider came and brought death and destruction but he was completely untouched. It was lined with red, just that bit of violence of blood, and the seal is red. And this is a part where one's intellect, to give it a pompous word, starts to take over, because I had had the glove holding a rolled seal. When I say seal, I mean um, rolled seal, a rolled scroll of parchment, but that looked too literal and there was always something else wrong. And this is what I mean by, for once, the intellectual side took over, which it has to, otherwise the emotional part becomes nothing, just a, a, too emotional. And I realized, damn it, that I had to take the gauntlet apart from the, the hand of the glove because the proportions were wrong. In fact, the glove almost looked as long as the gauntlet and it just looked appalling. So by doing that, I thought I actually don't need the scroll. So I put the seal on the bones and there's this tape as if the scroll had been unwound. Again, I've used tiny little bones, pieces of lace, and there is a little put my glasses on. It's a little rat's skull, which one of our cat, well, we only had two. Oh, and it's got a little vole skull on it as well. And the cat, who's long dead in the garden with a little cross, he brought this vole in. Bless his heart. And I kept the vole, snatched it out of the jaws of the cat, and kept it. And this is what I do. I keep them and keep them and clean them, you know, with a bit of toothpaste or hot water and gradually it started to build up but the top of the gauntlet I wanted to represent a kind of half scene a half dream evilness and yet look fairly pure and pretty so I've used very small birds shoulder blades which I put a pearl paint on and these little diamantes that lead down to the gauntlet, as I say, lined it with red, and then 
there's a little tooth laid across, a little fox's tooth bound with gold thread. And again, little drawn red lines that go down towards the palm of the hand. And that took me a long time. I think I had to wrestle with that piece more than I've ever done any. But it had to look almost as if it had done itself. And I hope it does. But Pale Rider, he's the boy. Yes, this glove is illustrated and the one we just talked about along with several others that I've done uh, are in this book called Roseanne Hawksley written by Mary Chaser um, and it is absolutely true to my life. I don't think I could have trusted anyone else. She had a way of listening but because she's a writer, as well as a curator, she's an archivist. We sat on the sofa and her dog was there. I went down to see her several times. And I knew that I could trust her. And I said, I don't want it to sound self-pityingly at all. I mean, self-pitying about me, self-pitying about me. Because uh, quite a lot's happened, you know, from when I was born in Portsmouth in 1931, went to the Royal College of Art, did fashion, heated it, and uh, all kinds of things in my life. So all the gloves are there, including two pieces. Uh, one is called The Queen of Spades, which is based on a story by Pushkin. And it was made into an opera by Tchaikovsky, and it's wonderful where the young man thinks he's won the money back, but actually his ace changes into the Queen of Spades. So I've done, uh, I think, ra rather a splendid glove about that. The two slightly mysterious ones that I did, one for Brian and one um, for me, except they changed. The one about Brian changed into his performance as an actor and it's called Our Revels Now Are Ended. These are actors, as I foretold you, have disappeared, gone. And the wedding one I was going to do about me as a partner to it actually started to be about Ophelia and when Ophelia says to Hamlet, you know, why are you treating me like this? You said you loved me. And Hamlet says, I never gave you aught. You know, I gave you no reason. She said, my lord, you did. And he said, well, I don't know why you wanted to beget evil children, get thee to a nunnery. And of course, nunnery, it was the word for brothel. So he's saying, don't you talk to me like that, get off to a brothel. So <laughs> that started to change. But again, I think, this has just come to me, again, it's got the unforeseen excitement, to me anyway, it's the excitement of a mixture of good and bad, if you like, to put it prosaically. There's the prettiness of the, of the ribbon and the veil round Ophelia. And then there's the glove being punctured by a rather male symbolic looking bone. And I like that when it happens. But, and other ones I've done are in this book by Mary Chaser. Mm -hmm.